Verse number 12, Proverbs chapter number 11. The Bible says, He that is void of wisdom despiseth his neighbor, but a man of understanding holdeth his peace. Now we've got to play a round of the definition game with y'all. We know that wisdom, right, we've taught on this before, wisdom, biblically, is knowing the right thing to do and how to do it according to what God says. It's knowing truth, but also how to use that truth. Okay, now wisdom according to the world is having knowledge, but then it being tempered with experience. Well, God's truth is true regardless of whether you're 12 or whether you're 112. Right? Truth is truth. But knowing how to use that truth, whether to apply it in your life, or how to use that truth to impact somebody else, according to your Bible, that's what wisdom is when it comes to the book of Proverbs. So we know what wisdom is. He also says, he that despiseth his neighbor. Now again, that's one that nowadays, if you use the word despise, it means to hate. Right? If you despise somebody, you loathe them. Right? Well, that's what we use it for nowadays. But if you go to the Webster's 1812 Dictionary, you're going to find it meant something else that people don't use it that way anymore. The word despise means that you think it has no value. Now, obviously, if you think that something doesn't have any value, you may dislike it, you may hate it, you may loathe it. Some people despise the dentist. That's why they hate going to the dentist. They don't see the point, right? They don't enjoy the experience. Right, well, have fun getting cavities. That's all I'm going to say. Right? And I hope you never get a root canal because you're going to be, be spending a lot of time at the dentist. Right? But if you despise something, you don't necessarily hate You just think that it doesn't have any value. Right? Somebody were to hold up a handful of Monopoly money today, I wouldn't go over and rob them for it. Right? It's just Monopoly money. Although some of our money is starting to look like Monopoly money. But right? Monopoly money, I just despise it. Doesn't have any value to me, unless I'm playing a game of Monopoly. Right? Those little foil coins that they give out every year for in Easter egg hunts and everything. I don't think it's a real gold coin. And unless I'm hankering for chocolate, it doesn't have any value to me. Right? There are things that you walk past every day, right? Unless you've got a runny nose, you don't see the value in the tissue. Right? Unless you come across the day that you need it. Then you find value in the tissue. Right? Same thing could be true to, you know, I can walk into a clothing store today. A lot of it's not going to have a lot of value to me. Right? Mine aren't wearing holes in it. Right? God's been good to me. I'm not running short on clothes. Right? So, new clothes. One might catch my eye. Is it because I need it? No, it's probably because I like the way that it looks. Right? But, all the other things, they just don't have value to me. Sometimes I like the way something looks until I figure out how much they want for it, and then it doesn't have any value for me. Right? We wait for sale or clearance, or we go down to outlet and hope that they still got one in my size. Right? But despise just simply means it doesn't have any value. Right? So let's go back to the verse, figure out what it is that he's saying. He said, he that is void of wisdom despises his neighbor. So by implication, if you are wise, you do not despise your neighbor. Okay, but what does it mean to despise your neighbor? Well, we've just said, it means that you think that your neighbor doesn't have any value. Right? All they are is a nuisance to you. Okay, which now begs the question, Lord, who's my neighbor? Well, a lawyer asked that to Jesus. And the answer that Jesus gave, if we boiled it down, it comes to anybody that comes across your way is your neighbor. By definition, neighbor is somebody you live around. So whether you run across them, you know, when they try to cut you off in traffic, or whether you run across them because you go to work every day and they're there too, right? anybody that God allows to cross your path is your neighbor. Okay? We do not exclude someone from God's blessings, God's mercies, or, you know, what's the word I'm looking for here? Right, just general decency because we don't know who they are or where they came from. That's the way that they used it back in the day. Well, if I don't know you, I don't owe you anything. But Jesus says, anybody that comes by your way, 
Right? They deserve your best. Why? Because in God's eyes, he gave his best for them. Anybody that comes by your way, that's your neighbor. Whether it's for a moment or whether you live around them a whole lot. You've got a whole lot of time where you're around them. It doesn't make a difference. Right? Everyone that you come across is your neighbor. So to despise your neighbor means that people in your life, right, I'm sure that we can all think of some of them, right, they don't amount to much in our appraisal. Right? Maybe we all got the one person that sits there and somehow gets away with not doing anything at work all day long, yet they still have a job. Right? I don't understand them people. Okay? I understand the desire to get paid for doing nothing. I just can't figure out how they pull it off. Right? We all know people that, you know, let's be honest, if you ever played a sport or if you guys have kids or grandkids that do play sports, there are parents of other children that you're not a big fan of because they say stupid things very loudly and you want to go over and tell them to shut up. Right? And even the kids, on the, sometimes they catch it and turn around and say, who in the world's parents said that? Right? Don't they very... Right? You're despising. Right? You're saying, that doesn't have any value. Right? But to despise your neighbor, that's not just despising their actions. That's not just saying, well, I don't agree with what they do. That means that you think that person is altogether useless. That's a dangerous place to be. The wise man doesn't despise his neighbor. But those that are void of wisdom look at other people and think, what's the use? Right, I think of, I can't remember where it could have been Discovery Channel, could have been History Channel. I can't remember where I saw it. Right, but they were going through the process of training back during World War II, Vietnam, different wars that America had. And if during a physical examination you got a 4F stamped on your form, it meant that you had no value to the American Army. They would not let you enlist. Right? Even though there was a draft, if you 4F, that meant you had no value. Most of the time it was for a medical condition. Right? But if for some reason the physician decided, well, because of this, the army can't use you. Right? They decided that that person was worthless in the eyes of the army. They couldn't run, couldn't jump, couldn't carry as They couldn't do the bare minimum. Right? And they got stamped for, and then, if y'all remember the, I can't even remember what year it came out now, but that first Captain America movie where he's about this big around and about that tall. Right? What's he do? He goes to eight different doctors, I think it was. Right? All of them say, no, you're ineligible. You're no value to us. And then he runs across the one guy that says, well, we might be able to change that. Right? And then, super steroids later, then he looks like Chris Evans. Right? Magic. But all those doctors had the same opinion. He doesn't have any value. Right? They despised him. They said, you're wasting our time. You're wasting your time. Go back and do something that you can do, but you can't do this. Right? Now, put yourself in the shoes of that doctor. Okay, somebody comes in, no value. What's that mean? You don't want them anywhere around. The reason that they would evaluate those people, you know why it was? Because if you couldn't do these things, you were a danger to the people around you. Right? You were more of a liability. They said, if we let you go into war, if you can't pull your own weight, somebody else is going to have to take up the slack, and as a result, they're in danger. That's why they didn't have any value. But let's make it about... When you look at somebody and you say... That per it's not that I don't like that person. It's not that they did anything to me. They just don't have any value. You know what that means? In your eyes, that person's dead to you. That's what it means. They're not worth talking to. They're not worth investing in. You've decided that because they're worthless, that means that there's no potential there that you could even try and draw out of somebody. You've decided that they are altogether not worth your time. 
You know what that causes? Literally, it causes a wedge. Wasn't a wedge that was put there by the devil. Right? Wasn't a wedge that was put there by, you know, the other person. You put it there and you keep trying to drive it home to get that person out of your life. Because you think it's dead weight, dead space. You think that, well, if that person gets involved in my life, it'll be a liability to me. Right? I'm going to be at danger if I interact with that person. Right, well, continue on with the second half of the verse. He says, but a man of understanding holdeth his peace. You see, that's the thing. Anybody in here ever had a mole cut off? Right, That's a abnormal growth in your skin. Could eventually become cancerous. It didn't have any value to you. So you went to the doctor and said, can we get rid of this? Right, and then sometimes they send it off for testing, do a little biopsy and figure out, well, hey, was there something wrong with that? Or was that person just weird? Right? But why do you do it? Because it has no value to you. In fact, because it has no value, you think that it could do harm by still being a part of you. So what's that mean? You actively took steps to have that thing removed from your life. A wise man holdeth his peace. But someone void of wisdom, guess what they do? They try to get that thing out of their life at any cost. They'll offend. They'll avoid. They'll try and make the other person angry. They look for excuses on what that person's done to cause them some slight so that they can confront them about it. What do you say? These are the two neighbors that hate each other so much they go out there and stand, stare at each other all day to see if the other one does something. They're looking for a way just to, for an excuse to try and drive that person out of their life. You see, some people, things that don't have value to them, what do they do? They just ignore them. But some people, if something has no value, they try to drive it out of their life. They want it gone. And, well, it's a very horrible thing. But that's what the U.S. government did to the Native Americans. They said, you have no value to us. You have to move so that we can take this. We're not giving you the option. We're going to put you on a death march called the Trail of Tears. And if you make it there, you get to live in the desert with the land that we didn't want. But they, they took active steps to remove the thing that they thought had no value. Right? One of the biggest atrocities in American history. Well, what do you do with the things in your life that have no value? Well, if you can ignore them, right, you ignore them. But your neighbor, that's somebody that's coming across your path all the time. You can't ignore them. They're a part of your life. That's why they're called your neighbor. And if you despise something that you have to deal with all the time, every time you look in the mirror and you think, that mole looks weird. Right, we should probably get that checked out. And the doctor says, we can get rid of that. Well, that's the thing about a neighbor. You can't get rid of a neighbor. Because a neighbor's a part of your life. They keep crossing your path. Right, if you despise them, what are you going to do? If you, can't get, if you can't ignore them, you're going to try and get rid of it. And when you realize that getting rid of a neighbor is a whole lot harder than you think, what do you do? You go into scorched earth policy, whatever it takes, DEFCON 1, we're going to war. Now, you may say, well, but Jordan, I've never thought that about somebody. Well, you may have never said, all right, it's time to go to war, little by little. All right, well, I'm just trying to ignore them. But every time that person says something, because they're under your skin, you hear it. doesn't matter how far away they are. Right? Every time that person does something, and if they're to your next door neighbor, every time they do something to their yard, it looks dumb, and you've got a critique for it. Why is it? It's because you despise them. But it says the man that hath wisdom holds his peace. If you can't get rid of it, and you despise it, what do you do? You don't hold your peace. Anything that crosses your mind, anything that you can come up with to try and avoid them, 
you do it. But the wise man says, if they cross my path, I'll hold my peace. What's that mean? Acceptance. Right? There are some things that you just can't get rid of. Now, ask our pastor. He will tell you because he was very young and dumb and because whenever he played a sport, he played it to not only win, but win at all costs. Half of his fingers and toes don't bend the right way no more because he broke them so many times. Right? What would you do as a kid? We used to bend them to see if he was telling the truth or not, and then he'd yell, ow, and we thought it was funny. Right? But he stuck with them. He can't get rid of them. You get rid of the broken toe that don't bend the right way no more, guess what? You can't walk. Right? You get rid of the fingers that don't bend the right way no more, guess what? You can't grab nothing. Right? You, you may have an arm and you may have a hand, but you can't do anything with either one of them. Right? Some things you just stuck with. What do you do? You accept it. Did not the Apostle Paul, when he prayed three times for the Lord to remove a thorn in his flesh, what did God say? My grace is sufficient for thee. The wise man holds his peace realizing that God put that person in your life for a reason. And by holding your peace, what you're really saying is you're living by faith. Lord, I know that this is, you know, it grieves me in the flesh, may grieve me in the spirit. I don't know why this person's in my life, but Lord, I understand you've got a purpose for it. And by faith, I'm going to accept it and hold my peace. We reign in the flesh and we say, there's a reason for this. The wise man understands that your neighbor is a part of your life. Right? But not by your choice, right? by what we would call divine intervention. God put that person in your life or allowed that person to become a part of your life for a reason. Right? So if you're, let's just do the math, if you're living in God's will and somebody comes across your life, guess what that means? God either allowed it or arranged it. Now, if you're out of God's will, you may run across people that God didn't want you to come across, but that's your fault. Right? But you're living in God's will, doing your best to follow after Him. Somebody comes into your life, God allowed it for a reason. So the wise man holds his peace. He doesn't want to drive a wedge. He's not trying to get rid of the person. He lets them get as close as God wants them to be. And he holds his peace. Okay, not doing... What's he doing? He's just doing his best to go on. If they interact, he interacts. Right? Because again, they would say, well, if, if you're not my neighbor, I don't owe you any pleasantries. Right? What did Jesus say? Treat people with decency. What was the big rebuke that the Pharisees had again? He was the friend of publicans and sinners. He was not only cordial, he was friendly with those that other people wouldn't associate with because they were so disreputable. Right? He not only talked to, he sat down and ate with those that other people wouldn't spit on. Right? He held his peace in the flesh. Right? I'm sure his flesh didn't like some of the places that he went. But why did he go? And why did he hold his peace? Because those people need to hear about God just as much as everybody else. About that woman at the well the reason she was there during the middle of the day to draw out water because the rest of the town wouldn't even look at her right she'd not just been divorced she'd been divorced five times and she was shacking up with one that wasn't her husband right we I don't know if y'all had to read it I had to read it it was a boring book the scarlet letter right that woman was made an example of for one act of adultery this woman was living in it so imagine how much they despised her even though she was their neighbor. They took every excuse to avoid that one, but yet Jesus talked to her like she was a human being. She asked him religious questions, and what did he do? He gave her the truth. He treated her with respect. Why? Because she was something that God made. She didn't make the right decisions, but God still wanted to save her. So how did he treat her? With love, because God loved her. He knew who she was, by the way. He said, where's your husband? And she says, I have no husband. And then he says, 
I know you don't have a husband. He tells her, I already knew you had five and the one that you're with isn't, it? isn't your husband. He knew long before he went to that well what kind of woman was going to meet him there. But yet, what did he say before they went? I must needs go through Samaria. He said, I've got an appointment with somebody that nobody else will even look at. And because of what God's going to do in her life, the whole town's going to come out to meet Jesus. To hear about the man that is the Christ. Why'd that happen? Because he held his peace. And then we can go one step further. She was a Samaritan. That meant that she was a half-breed between Jew and something else. Well, under Jewish custom, if somebody wasn't 100% Jewish, they was a Gentile. You didn't have anything to do it. They were unclean. They were impure. They couldn't be partakers of the things of God. But that's why they had to live in a different place than where the Jews did. She even looked at him and said, I know you being a Jew. How'd she know? Because of the way that he looked, the way that he dressed, the customs that he kept. Well, guess what that means? Not only socially, but also under the law. He had every reason to ignore that lady and treat her like a dog. But yet, he asked her for a drink of water. That's where the whole conversation starts. She said, a Jewish boy wants me to give him water? She says, you know that I'm a Samaritan, right? And he says, oh, I know a whole lot more about you than that. But yet, God still wants to give you a drink of a well that you've never tasted of before. Where'd that all start with? He could have despised her, but he didn't. He could have despised every single one of us. Why? Because we were born in sin, conceived in sin, sinners by, you know, nature and sinner by choice. Everything that we were flew in the face and completely contradicted what God intended us to be. Right? And was a testament of the fact that God chose or man chose sin over God. He had every reason to despise us. But he didn't. What did he do? He held his peace. God didn't pour out wrath. What did he pour out? Peace, grace, and mercy. Why? So that some could come back to what God intended them to be. Was that have a relationship with God? So, verse number 12 gives us all those details. But look with me down verse number 17. The man that holds his peace, what's that guy doing? He's showing grace and mercy. Right? This person has no value, but I'll hold my peace. I'll show them grace. I may give them things that they don't deserve. Well, verse number 17, The merciful man doeth good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. Here's the fruit of what happens in verse number 12. The merciful man. What's that? Somebody that looks at those things that have no value to the world, may have no value to their flesh, but yet you still show them grace. What's that? That's goodness. Right? Well, then you give them things that they don't deserve. What's that? That's mercy. Right? The two go hand in hand. You can't be merciful unless you're gracious. And unless you're gracious, you won't be merciful. So, what do you do to those things? What does the world say to do to those things that have no value to you? And if you see a cockroach in your house that has no value to you, what do you do? You either kill it, or if you're a sissy, you try and capture it and then let it out into the wild. Right? Because you don't want that on your conscience. But if you see a spider or an ant crawling around in your kitchen, if you're normal, you grab the raid and spray the whole house with it. Right? Or, if you're weird, right, you catch it, and then you try and let it outside, not realizing that that thing's probably already laid about 800 eggs in your house, and you're going to have a whole lot more, so just go get the raid and take care of it. Right? Or one of these days you're going to be calling the orking guy to come and fumigate your house. Right? But those things have no value to you. Right? They don't belong in your house. So what do you do? You get rid of it. Right? Or you just completely ignore it. Anybody remember the story of the Good Samaritan? That Jewish man that had been robbed and left for dead in a ditch? 
whole bunch of Jewish people that, according to the world, would say that they're righteous and that they were holy. Guess what they did? They looked at them and saw no value, and they kept going. They just ignored it. Oh, well, I'll pray for you. Well, how about you help me? I'll pray God send somebody by your direction. Well, God sent you by this direction. But they saw no value. But yet a Samaritan, again, somebody that the Jewish man wouldn't have done the same thing for him. But he came by, right, cleaned him up, poured oil in his wounds, bound him up, right, dressed the wounds, took him to a place where he could heal up, and then paid for all the time that he was going to stay. And then he said, if he stays longer than what I've given, put it on my account. When I come back through, I'll pay the debt. So that guy had a reputation that he was good for his word, or else the innkeeper wouldn't have accepted the offer now he's saying let this guy get back to what he was because I see value in that man but everybody else that saw him what they see something just to ignore something that wasn't worth their time would have been a waste of money to try and heal him up in truth they looked at him and they said he's already past the point of helping he's dead Dead man laying. He wasn't even walking. Right? It's going to be any time now. There's nothing I can do. That saw no value. See, some people, when they despise other people, what they really do is they look at other people and they say, are they worth my time? Am I going to get something out of this? Or... Is there some other, like I said, I don't need clothes, but I may like the way that something looks. Right? Do they add anything to my life? Right? Are they funny? Do I like hanging around them? Right? Do they tell good stories? Can they teach me something? Right? That's how people evaluate other people and whether or not they want to associate with them. But when you despise somebody, you say, I can gain nothing from you. There's no sense in giving you anything. It's just going to be a waste. But the merciful man says, doeth good to his own soul. And the cruel, that troubleth his own flesh. See, somebody that you look at and you see no value... Why is that? Okay, a lot of times it's because there's a problem with us. Let's just be honest. We don't have the right spirit. And we only look at the outward to try and judge the inward. Right? But God even rebuked his own prophet. Same when he said, man, look at on the outward appearance. God, look on the heart. Right? You'd be amazed to some of the people. A lot of them up there on that banner right there. That when they came, they didn't look like what God made them into. Right, we can look around the building that there's a lot of us that before God got a hold of us, it'd been real easy to say, that person doesn't have much value. That they're not worth my time. I don't like the way that the, you know they act. That they got a reputation. It'll ruin my reputation if I start associating with them. Well, let me just humble you a little bit. Okay? Nobody cares that much about you anyway. Okay? Your reputation isn't much of one to begin with. Right? We're the crazy crowd that carries Bibles and guns and goes to church three times a week. Right? The world thinks we're nuts. Right? But what do people think? Just be merciful. Why do you think those things about that person? Well, maybe because you you don't have the right spirit. Two, it may be because you know selfish and prideful. Think more of yourself than what you ought to be, and we don't have time to read all the proverbs that have to deal with that. Right? Not to mention that there's one in this chapter that says that with pride comes shame. Because if you get too big for your britches, God will humble you, and you'll be ashamed of what you went through. Okay, but. Other times, people look at other people and they decide that they despise them. Why? Because of what they look like, the way that they act, maybe where they come from, 
how they talk or the way that they live their life. Well, that's mighty hypocritical, isn't it? Because how did we walk? How did we live? Where did we come from? What did we look like? And what did we sound like before God got a hold of us? We think, well, I don't want that person associated with my life. Well, God didn't want you as you were associated with Him. He wanted you as He saw you in His Son to be associated with Him. God took you out of the miry clay to make you into a new creature. You know what we should see when we see somebody that in our flesh, we want to say that person doesn't have any value. You know what we ought to say? wonder what God can make them into. Just being honest. What we used to be, off scour the world. We lived in hedges along highways. Had no home. world didn't want anything to do with us. We couldn't be associated, but yet God came looking for us. Not because of what we were, but because of what we would be in His Son. Right? He saw us as we would be. Well, after you got saved, guess what? He sees you as you will be. You're robed in the righteousness of His Son. Even now, He doesn't look at what you are. He sees what you will be. Even after you got saved, what you are isn't good enough for God because the standard is Christ. One of these days, I'll get there. Right? I read what happens during the rapture. Those that died before the rapture, guess what? They get a new body. Guess what? Looks like His. We which are alive and remain, guess what? We get caught up. We're quickly changed into what? What looks like Him. One of these days, we will be enough. But right now, who am I to look at somebody else and say, that person doesn't have any value? I don't want them to be associated with me. In fact, I'll go out of my way to make it known that I don't want anything to do with that person. Because let's flip the tables here. As much as you don't like bugs in your house, from the bug's perspective, it was just trying to get some food. It was trying to find a place that was a little warm. Right? It didn't want to be outside in the 28 degree weather that we had this morning because it was used to the 70 degree weather we had two days ago. Okay? It's just trying to survive and then all of a sudden somebody sprayed bug killer on it and guess what? It died. From the bug's perspective, we could say that that's a little bit cruel. Well, how much more cruel do you think that it is that you want to excise somebody from your life at all costs? That you'd go to any measure to make it known that that person doesn't have anything to do with you. You don't want anything to do with them. Every time they talk, you're trying to discredit them. Every time that they do something, you're critiquing. You're trying to drive that wedge in between you and that other person. Well, if they're lost, how cruel is it to decide that somebody doesn't deserve to hear about Christ? Right? Instead of being a stepping stone, what are we? we're a stumbling block to that person. And let's be honest. Right? Somebody probably asked everybody in here, well, hey, where do you go to church at? I go to church at Main Baptist Church. Oh, Baptist. Why do they say that? Because somebody along the way despised them. And instead of showing them mercy and grace, guess what they showed them? Cruelty. Because somebody thought they weren't worth anything. That they didn't want them in their life. That they cared more about themselves than they did about others. That showed cruelty to them. The exact opposite of what God commands us to show. What's He tell us to do? Show them love. Not love as man knows, but the love of God. What's the love of God? God doesn't look at what you are. He sees what you can be. And see, the beauty of it is, is that it's not what you can be, it's what you will be. Because if God saves you, you will be like Christ. One day, it's already settled. Your conversations are recorded in heaven. We're seated in heavenly places, the Bible tells us. God already knows us as we will be. In fact, go read the book. The, John the Revelator already saw you as you will be in heaven. 
Right? The love of God says it doesn't matter what you are. All that matters is that you are. All that matters to God is that somebody need one, they're alive, and two, they need him. What he command us to do? Go into all the world, preach unto every living creature. What's that mean? Anything that hath breath. It means as long as they're living and walking and kicking, God still cares about them. But see, yet, yeah, that's sitting in the notes, but I thought about it last night. God said, say, anybody got a car like mine where you got different modes? You got eco mode, you got normal mode, you got comfort mode, and then the one that I'm afraid to put the car in, which is sport mode, right? All those different modes, still same car. Right? But what controls all it? There's a computer in your car called an ECU. And that's what runs the car. Right? It's not your foot pressing the gas. When you press gas pedal, the computer tells the car, go vroom, vroom. Right? When you hit brake, computer tells the engine, stop revving, and then the brakes apply to the tires, you slow down. Because if you're pressing the brake and the engine's still revving, guess what? It ain't slowing down. Or it's not slowing down as quick. Right? When you do this on the blinker, the computer is what tells the blinker to start blinking. Right? But all those different modes, where do they go? They go to the computer. The computer is what controls the car. See, most people, right, they live their life, they are the computer, and they've got these different modes that they can go into. you got work mode where you just want to get stuff done, or if you're like me, you don't want anybody to bother you because I'm working and I don't have time to be distracted. Right? I just get into a zone. Then there's let's hang around people, which that drains the gas bat, the gas tank real quick if you're Jordan. Right? It's just exhausting being around people. I don't know what it is. Right? Brother Randy and I are both introverts. We understand this. He's giving me a thumbs up from the crow's nest. Right? Then you've got, right, well, I want to go to church mode. I want to study mode. I want to get in the Bible. I want to pray. They're all modes, but no. The computer shouldn't be us. The computer should be our spirituality, that new creature. And no matter which mode we go into, guess what's controlling Jordan? It's spirituality. Everything should be filtered through right? the new creature. But for most people, new creature is just a mode that they go into for a little bit until they decide, well, this one's more convenient. That, well, if your computer that's controlling your car, which is you, right, is your spirituality, guess what? Regardless of what mode you're in, guess what it's putting out? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, temperance, gentleness, meekness, fruit of the Spirit. Right, you're showing, right, regardless of how fast you're going, whether you're doing it in comfort mode or sport mode, Right, or eco mode, regardless of what it is, guess what? When you drive by, guess what people see? They see that new creature. They see Christ living in us. Right? Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Doesn't matter what mode you put it in, guess what the exhaust sounds like? Jesus loves you. Right? When you put the blinker on, it says, I'm going this way, but if you want to follow me, I can show you where Jesus is. Right? But nope. Too often we get into work mode or we get into I don't want to be around people mode or we get into, well, I need to go clean the house today instead of going on visitation, even though I know I could probably do both. We get into those modes. Guess what? If I'm in work mode, very few things mean anything to me. Why? Because I'm focusing on working. In fact, anything that keeps me from working while I'm in work mode, guess what? doesn't have value to me. Let's be honest. That's the way that people expect you to work when you're on the clock. Right? There are always exceptions. There's emergencies. People can call you. Right? But they don't want you sitting there chit-chatting all day on the phone with somebody instead of doing your job. They want you in work mode. Right? Some people, you get home, well, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, got to do this. We just go into a mode. 
Really, what we're trying to, we're just trying to live our life. But see, when you're just trying to live your life, guess where your focus is? Right here. On me. But yet, how much of the Bible tells us that our focus should be outward? On others. First, our focus should be on Him. Right? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. But then also, we're supposed to be looking at others in the church because we're fitly framed together. And we're supposed to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Guess what that is? That's called being merciful. We're supposed to look to the world and see those that need Him. And we're supposed to go to those that won't come and tell them. You know what that's called? Being merciful. Being gracious. We're supposed to look at those people that cross our lives and we think, just get out of the way. No, God put you here for a reason. While you're here, I'm going to treat you like a human being. Long before Jesus ever told that woman at the well anything about religion, guess what he did? And the thing that baffled her was that he talked to her like a human being instead of how most Jews talk to Samaritans. Then even as she's talking with him, he says, I know who you are, but yet I'm still here talking to you. Then she starts asking, well, hang on, let me ask you this. We worship up on the mountains. Right? Jews say you got to worship down in the temple. He said, the time now is that those that want to worship it, worship him in spirit and in truth. What what he say? From now on, neither one's going to be right. What is right is that you worship him in spirit and in truth. What's she saying? You can get in. Well, merciful people look at those that have no hope. Why do they have no hope? Because they think they're worthless. They think there's no reason to go on. And they look at them and say, I've got something that can help you. Do you try and shove it down their throat? No, you just try and treat them like a human being, let them know that somebody does care. If nothing else, you care for them and God cares for them. To some people, that blows their mind because they don't think they're worthy of it. They don't think that they deserve it. And they think that people are only nice to you if they think they can get something in return. But no, wise man holds his peace doesn't talk about what he sees and instead he's merciful because guess what when you're merciful according to verse number 17 you do good to your own soul you understand that when we show mercy to others because Christ showed mercy to us right that strengthens that gives life to that new creature you're getting stronger spiritually when you exercise those things that Christ told you to be so you're growing spiritually. You do good to your own soul. But at the same time, when God sees us just being obedient because we love Him and we show His love to other people, it's real hard for God not to bless you. He already blesses us, shake down, you know, press down, shaking, bubbling over. Daily He loatheth us with benefits. But see, those that look like His Son, live like His Son, guess what? They just live and the approval of God. You do good to your own soul being merciful. But yet, when we're cruel, do you realize that when we show cruelty to others, you're grieving the very Holy Ghost in your soul? Because everything that the Holy Ghost says, is what, well, Jesus said that the Comforter would come, that He wouldn't t testify of Himself, that He would testify of Christ. The whole purpose of the Holy Ghost during the Grace Age is what? To speak about who Christ was, why He came, what He did while He was here, and how all of that means you can get saved and go to heaven. He's the witness that Christ was here. Right? The earnest of our salvation, the proof that what we got is real. So what's he want to do? He wants to go and tell. But yet when you're cruel to somebody else, what you should feel is conviction where he says, even though God could have been cruel to us, could have poured out his wrath and his judgment on us, he showed us love. 
Why don't you show that person love? But see, if you cruel over and over again, guess what? The Holy Ghost. You can tell Him no enough. There's always, for each one of us, you can tell God no the last time. The Bible talks about some that are saved that He turns over to the destruction of the flesh so that the soul might be saved. You're vexing your own soul when you do cruelty to others. We justify it and we don't think it's cruel. But we try and rationalize it in our brain on why we were in the right and they were in the wrong. But see, cruel is cruel. There's right, there's wrong. But you can do the right thing a cruel way. You can do the wrong thing a cruel way. Cruelty is not about right and wrong. Cruelty is about intent. You wanted to do harm to that person. You wanted to cut them out of your life. You wanted to do them so wrong that they'd leave and never come back. All the while, you're trying to do harm to somebody else. Guess what? You're doing harm to you. The consequences of being merciful are, guess what? You receive mercy. Consequences of being cruel or that that cruelty that you're showing outward, it's taking root inwardly. It's changing who you are. It's affecting you in such a way that those that you don't mean to be cruel to, guess what? You'll be cruel to them. I think of Scrooge from a Christmas carol. Even when he did good things, guess what? Everybody thought, man, that guy. Who in the world wants to deal with that guy? Everybody hated going and asking for a loan. Why? Because they knew they'd have to deal with Scrooge. Even if you were using it for something good, he'd make you feel like you were worthless when he walked out the door. He'd criticize you, critique you, tell you all the reasons why your idea wouldn't work, and how he'd be happy to take you home if you couldn't pay the debt back. But was it? He was just cruel. He was a curmudgeon. What was he? He was a pain in the butt is what he was. Well, how do people get like that? It starts because they were cruel, but that cruelty became a part of them. So in short, what's the moral behind the two Proverbs? Be merciful because mercy was shown to you. Embrace what God did in you. Show it to other people. Regardless of who that, because that's what mercy means. That you don't receive what you deserve. Instead, you get what you didn't deserve. And what's grace? Just being good to people, regardless of the circumstances. Being good because God's been good to you. You want to know why the first in the early church in Jerusalem, you want to know why they turned the world upside down? Because they just took what they received of God and showed it to other people. You don't know why churches today, a lot of them are drying on the vine? Because rather than taking what God gave and giving it out, they hoard it, trying to hang on to it. It wasn't ours to have. He told us to bear much fruit. The tree doesn't own the fruit. The fruit falls off. Right? Our reward is Him. It's not everything that He's given us. To be merciful for mercy's sake. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.